So the date, September 21st, 2013. It's a little after 7 p.m. We haven't eaten or slept much that day at all. And quite frankly, we're pretty stressed out. You see, for the past three months, we've been building a business pitch, a plan, talking to farmers, all waiting for the moment we can hold that big, beautiful piece of cardboard. And when we did, we realized, holy shit, we won. You see? So I'm going to take the next 10 minutes and cover a couple bit different topics about what happened 16 months ago and what's been happening since. I'm going to highlight the impact of TFF, the growth of Henlight, and I'll talk to you a little bit about the great man theory and why it matters to the TFF community. But first, a little about myself. So my name is Edward Silva, and I'm the co-founder of Henlight. Along with my colleague here, Lorena Galvin, Brian Pond, and Aaron Haldeman, we developed, using a simple technology in a novel approach, the first fully integrated solar-powered lighting solution for pasture-raised poultry operations, or small-scale farmers that allows poultry to maintain a more consistent production as the days get shorter. But before I talk about how we've impacted farmers, I want to talk a little bit about how TFF has impacted us. You see, Thought for Food does a lot of different things, but I want to break it up into two core pieces. Define problem and a platform for action. Define problem, very simply said, how do we feed 9 billion people by 2050? For any aspiring entrepreneur, you know a problem well-defined is solution half-solved. And by Thought for Food bringing this problem, making it very clear to us what they've been able to do and impact our team and everyone in the room, is they've given us focus. Without focus, you know how it is as an entrepreneur. There's a million shiny things, and you're chasing all of them. But by having a problem and clear focus, you're able to hone your energy on a specific issue you want to pay attention to. That's one impact. The second is a platform for action. What good is a bunch of focus, a bunch of energy? There's nothing you can really do about it, right? You've sat in classrooms where the teacher just gripes and gripes. You finish the quarter, no one does anything, and you move on. But this platform for action is really important, and it happens in multiple ways. The competition, the mentors, the design thinking labs, social media, the community. And what this provides our generation, and really anyone in the TFF community, is a voice. You get the chance to take the focus that you've done what you've learned, actually do something about it. There's not really a lot of opportunities you get in life to do that and to do it within a community. So this is incredibly impactful for, I imagine, a lot of the folks in the room, but especially for Henlight. Because what it did is it empowered us to develop solutions towards food security. We could actually do something. We can build street cred, right, in terms in food security. And this is really important. It's important for the community at large, but from a personal perspective, and something I didn't expect to happen 16 months ago, it's, it's important for my own personal development. You see, since Thought for Food 16 months ago, I've been able to leverage my experience in the competition, my experience winning and running Henlight, to, for other opportunities that have allowed me to speak on behalf of Thought for Food, to speak on behalf of food security. One, in this last year, I was chosen as one of four US delegates to go to the Y20, which is sort of the youth version of the G20, where youth from around the world come, Last year was in Australia. We come and we put together a list of action items, things that are important to youth around the world that the G20 should then focus on. So we put together this communique, and my topic was sustainable development and, in turn, food security and why that mattered. And it was exciting. And being able to talk about Thought for Food and share that with hundreds of youth around, hundreds of youth around the world was incredibly empowering. Additionally, I was also able to participate in the Global Youth Startup Summit. This is where we brought hundreds of entrepreneurs from around the world to Kuala Lumpur and Malaysia to talk about entrepreneurship, share best practices. I was able to attend this and get into this summit by leveraging my experience in Not For Food and leveraging the opportunity I had experienced. So those are both great things for sort of a personal development. But from professional development, I still hold a day job. I work at UC Davis in California for an ag tech incubator within a business school. And before I had participated in Thought For Food, I was easily the youngest person in the room the youngest person in the whole building, and quite frankly, didn't get a lot of respect from the faculty who were tenured and from my boss who was, you know, going to sit in that job for the next 30, 40 years. But after coming back from Thought for Food, all of a sudden, sort of the week I came back, people began to invest in me. They were paying for me to go to do trainings. They saw what was possible and that I had some experience in food security. And all of a sudden, in my own job, at my own staff meetings, I had a bigger voice at the table. 
And so these impacts with, on thought for, that thought food had on me still sort of last in the job, still last within Henlight, and still have a really large impact on everything I do. But you may be asking, great, Edward, you got to travel to Australia, you got to do some stuff, your people at work respect you. What happened with the $10,000? And so I'll tell you. But let's go back. October 16th, 2013, we come back from Germany. We're in California. We're having our first post-win meeting. We all sort of sit down and look at each other and we're like, $10,000, this is nice. Now what? So before we used any money, and we were very conservative, we said, well, let's establish some ground rules. First, let's find out what we don't know very quickly and find someone who does. We don't need to waste this money learning how to code, learn how to be engineers. No, let, let's find someone who can do that really well. Second, and this was a piece of advice we got in within 10 minutes of winning the prize in Berlin. It's a little more tangible, but persistent weekly meetings. So many good ideas die because of just lack of momentum. Teams don't meet, they don't focus, they don't get the chance to voice. And so we decided okay, we will have a meeting every week. If it's Christmas week, maybe we'll make it 20 minutes, but nonetheless, we will meet every single week. And we did, and we have since October 16th, 2013. And so what we did when we established these ground rules, we just said, well, let's do some market research. If you remember my pitch last year, we said, well, we're going to focus on small-scale farmers and emerging economies around the world. Well, so our first rule, we discovered that's really tough to do, and we really didn't know how to do that quite well. So what can we do first to learn? So we decided, with the help of a lot of mentors, to focus on a target segment called pasture-raised poultry farmers. They're very prevalent in the United States, and it's a growing segment, as well as with a lot of Western countries, um, developed countries as well. And what it is, is a simple operation where chickens live in these mobile coops. These mobile coops work in a diversified operation, and they'll travel around the pasture. Chickens are free to go inside and outside. These eggs sell at a high cost. There's a high demand. And it's a much more humane way of growing poultry. And they have a lot of technological problems because people are not serving them. Entrepreneurs are not building technology for them. So we said, great, we will build these solar-powered units. We'll connect them to these integrated lights with a specific software that we established using a specific poultry wavelength. It makes it super easy for the farmer and solves a very specific problem for them. It works within their system, which is the most important thing. We didn't ask the farmer to change anything. We said, no, this will go into whatever you're already doing. It'll work perfectly for you. And you know what? It's going to give you a 10 to 15% increase in production. For a small-scale farmer, and my dad himself being a small-scale farmer, that's huge. Being able to tell a farmer that and then be able to prove it to them month after month, as we've been able to do, is an incredible, incredible feeling. And so over the last year, or about last 16 months, here's a couple of the accomplishments we've been able to do and some things we've been able to do with the $10,000. Just to highlight a couple of them, we were able to engineer a prototype, develop a market-ready product, and I'm happy to announce as of this last September we sold our first unit to a farmer in California and have been able to sell to over 16 different farmers up and down the state as well. We are now in the phase where we are doing some fundraising and exploring new markets and developing some partnerships. Besides our partnership with TFF, obviously, we've been able to get a partnership with Autodesk, which has provided us tons of free software to be able to prototype much quicker, as well as access to something called Tech Shop. We've also been able to validate our technology with something called AWA, Animal Welfare Approved. We don't want a technology that hurts the farmer, hurts the animal, or messes up their system. And so we're working really closely with these folks to make sure it fits the need. And a great thing is they have a bunch of other technological needs, which for a hardware startup is great news for us. So my final point, the great man theory. So my colleagues at UC Davis study this a lot, and a lot of historians have. So the great man theory of innovation says this, that behind every single innovation in history, there's one great man, one individual, who is responsible for that. Things were never the same before, and things are never the same after. Well, UC Davis, my colleague, who's pretty professional, sums up his thoughts about this in kind of one word. Bullshit. The innovations, the Ford, Fleming, Edison, the things they're known for, there were so many people, so many collaborators and teams and history that came before that to get them to that point. That why do these people get the name for that invention. And so history shows that's not actually true, right? This isn't how innovation works. It's not one man with one idea. It's groups of people 
It's history, it's timing, it's collaboration. Quite frankly, my point is, it's a thought for food community, right? Winning the $10,000 is incredibly valuable, don't get me wrong. But being part of the community, being able to reach back to the community, still be here today and feel like I'm actually in front of family, that is way more valuable. And it's way more successful rate of innovation. History shows that it's the community that will actually get you where you need to be. So I guess my final point, a message to the 10 teams, wherever you are practicing, I'm sure. It's a community. You may walk away with $10,000 today. You may walk away with nothing more than a free trip to Lisbon. But it is the community, whether it's in your own team or this larger community, that will get you to where you need to be, that will get you to continue innovating. With that said, thank you for your time and good luck. Yeah.